Hello, and welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club program. I'm Julia Flynn Seiler. The club would like to thank the Bernard Osher Foundation for supporting today's Good Lit event and also Wonderfest for their continued partnership. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. O Umuwa Shields, author of Life on Other Planets, a memoir of finding my place in the universe. Dr. Shields is an astronomer, astrobiologist, and the Claire Booth Luce Associate Professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of California, Irvine. She was also a classically trained actor and founder and director of Rising Star Girls, a program dedicated to encouraging girls of all colors and backgrounds to learn, explore, and discover the universe using theater, writing, and visual art. Now, before we get started, if you have questions for Dr. Shields, please submit them in the YouTube chat, and we'll get to them later in the program. Uh, Dr. Shields, welcome to the Commonwealth Club. And thank you for writing such a deeply personal and, and truly inspiring book. In your memoir, Life on Other Planets, you write that a sense of wonder is a good place to start. And I was hoping you could you could start there in a sense and tell us about the moment as a child when you looked up and began your lifelong fascination with the sky. Well, thank you so much, Julia, for being here and for the invitation uh, to me to be here. Uh, it's an honor. And when I would look up at the sky as a child, I I could always quickly go to that question, which has continued to pervade my consciousness as I've grown older, which is, are we alone in the universe? That is what I would think when I'd look up. I would I would look at these these pinpoints of light in the sky, which I learned uh, eventually were stars, and I would think to myself, is anything looking back at at me? What's what's out there? How far does it all go? Um, and that led me to ask more and more questions um, as I continue to look up at the sky. Hmm. Now, you grew up in Miramar, California. You're a Californian girl. Uh, yeah. And of course, Miramar is kind of well known for being the home of the Blue Angels. Tell us a little bit about your childhood. What was it like? Yes. Yeah, so my my grandmother worked for Miramar Air Force Base. Um, and we lived in in the surrounding area of San Diego, California. And we would go to those Blue Angels air shows on the weekends. And there would be cars lining up for miles to get into the, the major area where we'd all put blankets down and we would crane our necks up and look at these Blue Angels. These are This is an aerial flight team. And what they do is kind of defies um, human consciousness that they really like make all of these patterns in the sky and diamonds and, and come within mere yards of each other. And and that that was an early introduction for me to what one could do it, once you left the boundaries of, of the surface of our planet. Um, and that really um, kind of allowed me to dream and to look up at the sky and think uh, and wonder what, what more can we do up there and out there. I can just picture you as a little girl on that blanket, but I have to think about you also uh, like so many of the rest of us watching the movie Top Gun and Top Gun was in, you know, of course, set in the San Diego area. And I'm wondering, did that movie play a role in your dreams as a kid? Oh, my gosh. Yes. I so I was so this was 1983 or thereabouts, I think, when that movie came out or was being made. And, you know, when I watched it, it was it movies, as I write in the book, are this sort of catalyst for much in my life and have continued to be. I loved movies and TV shows growing up. And often those those movies and TV shows had a special focus. They were focused on science fiction or you know something to do with the sky or the deep ocean, the other uh, frontier. Um, but Top Gun specifically, there was this, this woman in the movie played by Kelly McGillis. And uh, it was Charlotte Blackwood was the character, call sign Charlie. And <laughs> I remember there was a moment when she was introduced for who she really was. So the night before um, Tom Cruise and Anthony Edwards characters had kind of sang a song to her and Tom Cruise had hit on her and she hadn't told him who she really was. 
the next day at Top Gun, the pilot school, the training school, the academy, uh, she's introduced by Michael Ironside's character. And, you know, Michael, uh, Michael Ironside has this very gravelly voice. And, and he says, um, she is a civilian contractor and she has a PhD in astrophysics, but she is a civilian contractor. So you do not salute her. And she walks down the, the aisle between these groups of fighter pilots. And she's got like, sheer black pantyhose and pumps and and her like business skirt and top and and then she whips around with these aviator glasses that are shining and she's got this curly blonde hair that's like catching the sunlight and i thought at that moment astrophysics like sign me up like i want to be like her so that again it was like Many of us did. <laughs> these little moments and of course it was being popularized but i thought astrophysicists can look like her and can be like her like that's what I wanted so that is so great and I, I've got to got to just tell you me and many other people of course this weekend went to the Barbie movie I went with my nieces oh, wow. and uh I was looking for astrophysicist Barbie in the end credits you know I hope they have an astronaut Barbie at least Mattel came up with that but yes it was I'm a time when we started to see representation of women in these very unusual science roles and explorer roles and uh you know Top Gun too so that was pretty uh pretty pretty cool movie to have that character I thought um so from Miramar you headed east to Phillips Exeter uh the boarding school in the east coast and uh Phillips Exeter was such an extraordinary school. It had its own space observatory, uh, or maybe you don't call it a space observatory, maybe just an observatory. Did you spend a lot of time as a high school student in that observatory? I did. That was the, the deci deciding factor for me to go into Exeter was that they had their own observatory. Um, I, I sort of went, I applied because of... of a boy I had a crush on was also applying and I would not be outdone by him. We were, we were rivals in class. And then I found out that it had, they had their own observatory. And I was like, I forgot about the boy and was like, I'm going. And, um, and from as soon as I could, I took astronomy courses. So if I remember correctly, we had to take physics first. So I took like a year of physics and then astronomy was sort of an elective course. And as soon as I was eligible, I started taking those courses and there were three of them. And I got to take all three astronomy courses, one, two, and three. And I eventually became a proctor at the observatory, which meant I got a set of keys. And that meant I could go out there whenever I wanted. So not only was I responsible for public viewing nights, so we opened the domes up um, at night for the people in the town. It wasn't just open to students, but anyone could come in and we would show them the moon and Saturn and any other um, astronomical phenomena that were visible in the night sky. Um, but I could like come out there anytime I wanted, any night, if I, instead of going to visit friends at a nearby dorm or going to a dance, I could go to the observatory. Um, and it was so special. I, I learned how to develop um, pictures there because back at, back in the day, astronomical images were actually, they were, you had to learn how to develop actual photographic film. There weren't, uh, it wasn't electronic the way it is now. We use things called charged couple devices, CCDs, that to produce these images. And that's what we see the images on. But back then it was like any picture that you would take of, of any person. You had to go into a dark room and, and put the paper into different solutions and then hang the paper up on clothespins and, on, and then you'd see your image um, materialize, you know, and... And that was very powerful too. Mm. And of course, you were such a responsible high school student. You never snuck in there after hours, <laughs> to parties, or of course not. Of course, of course not. not. Just checking, <laughs> just checking on that. Now you discovered a second love at Exeter, and that was acting, wasn't it? Or maybe you found it before that, but certainly at, at Exeter, it was encouraged and it came out. Tell us about your experience with that. Yeah, that this is something I hadn't counted on when I went to Exeter. So earlier, if I back up a little bit, when I was 12, I was I was shown the movie Space Camp in seventh grade and I plotted out my whole career. And it was I was going to be an astronaut. I was going to go to MIT. I was going to major in astronomy and eventually a, apply to NASA. And so Exeter was part of that plan because they had their own observatory and they also 
had excellent academics and I thought I had a pretty good shot of getting into MIT if I went to Exeter and did well. But what I hadn't counted on was acting. Um, some girlfriends uh, dragged me to an audition for the play Steel Magnolias, and I didn't really care much about it. I thought it would be a nice break from doing homework, and I ended up getting cast. And it changed a lot at that point because I... I found in the rehearsal for that play, and it was so exciting. I mean, I, we showed up and saw a stage become a hair salon, a beauty salon. Um, I remember the director told me on our on my winter break to go back home and get a manicure and a pedicure, like to learn how to, <laughs> that was my homework because I played Truvy, um, Dolly Parton's character in the film. Dolly Parton played that character. And it's her salon, and so I had to learn what how to how to perform manicures. And so they, he told me to go get one. And and in learning how to to rehearse a play with these other women in the in the cast, I began to feel a sense of community. We were preparing something that eventually we were going to show to the world, and it was incredibly powerful. If you've ever seen the movie with Sally Field, that kid, that moment when. She just, it's one of my favorite mo uh, fa favorite moments in all of cinema um, when she's having, I won't give it away if you haven't seen it, but she's having a very emotional moment. And and that's what act, I learned that this, like eventually as I continue to act, that it's it's really hard to do those moments well. You know, you don't try to cry. You're trying to, to keep yourself together. And because you have all of that emotion behind you and all of that history of creating that that um, that life as that character and that background, it all can't help but but make you cry, you know. And then that's that's the difference between good acting and not maybe not so good acting is trying to cry versus not trying to cry, but having all of that stuff underneath that ends up making you cry despite trying not to cry. And Sally Field is one of the best in the business and us creating those moments where people were going to feel something like we were going to make them feel something um, because of what we had created together. It was incredibly powerful. And then we were going to do it all over again the next day. And like that began my introduction to a sense of what it meant to be part of a group that was working towards a common goal. At that point in my life, I thought astronomy was, it, it was, I loved it. However, it felt very singular, like I was a solo, a solo person with my telescope looking up at the sky and 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 loving that. And and yet here I was discovering something else that I also loved that um, allowed me and encouraged me to work with others um, towards something. And so it was like I, I had these two loves all of a sudden and um, I continued to do them at Exeter without any question and without any indication that I would have to choose. But then eventually, as I got closer to graduating, it became clear to me that I, at least I thought, that I would have to choose. Well, you kind of chose by heading towards MIT. I mean, that certainly seemed to be a choice towards astronomy. Uh, yes. But I, I was so tickled to read, of course, that you managed to perform there. You found a way to perform as a member of an all-female a cappella group. And I've got to ask you, tell us about the pie song. <laughs> what was the yes. pie song? <laughs> well, it's like everything at MIT, as I say in the book, holds mathematical significance. There's there's a building called the Kresge Auditorium, which has which, which is one eighth of a sphere and has supports in only three places. Um, you know, there's a lot of places on the campus where there's like, there's only, there, there's a mathematical element. Like we can, the the Mass Ave Bridge has been, has been measured in a certain number of um, smoots, which is named after someone named Oliver Smoot, who was a pledge, who they measured him end to end across that bridge. So they know exactly how many. Um, so there's a lot of mathematical significance. And so it would, of course, it would make sense for the acapella groups there to have their, their techie song. And for us, I was a member of the MIT Muses, the all-female acapella group on campus. And we had the Pi song, which was um, singing the that 
the number pi 3.14, but we sang it out to, I forget how many places, it's a non-terminating, non-repeating number, so it keeps going, but we sang it out to maybe 11 or 12 places, like 3.14. One five nine two. I just kept going. So um, that was that was a fun song, and it always got a lot of laughs from the audience. Oh, that's great! And you had overall a very good experience at MIT, enough so that you pretty quickly went straight into a graduate program at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. But I think this is one of the places that I was so touched by in your memoir. You you started to lose confidence in yourself there. And I wanted to ask you, what was going on? What happened? I mean, you you sail through Exeter. Uh, you're a confident, uh, smart science kid. You make it into MIT, and then you go straight into graduate school pretty much. But something happens. What happened? Well... I had been experiencing this conflict in little bits and pieces ever since Exeter. Like at Exeter, as I said, I didn't feel as if I had to choose. I was able to do astronomy and acting and take French and be on the softball team and do a chamber orchestra. And that was wonderful. I never felt put in a box. There were some times in some math courses that where things got got tough, the higher I got in math. Um, but I remember having really dear and caring professors and instructors who worked with me. Um, and the fact was I was I was in a pretty high echelon of, of math at Exeter. I, I, so I was doing more and the, the more you do, the harder it can get. Um, but as you say, I did, I graduated with high honors and I went on to MIT and it became pretty clear to me pretty early on that I was gonna need some sort of creative outlet. And I thought the acapella group would be enough, but it wasn't. I missed acting. And one of the biggest messages of my book is that those dreams that we leave behind, they don't die. Um, I think I write about it in a certain way, which is that 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 dream I had left somewhere on the along the highway and I'd kept going on my on my merry way with the other dream. And eventually at MIT, the dream that was left on the side of the road caught up. And it said, hey, hey, I'm here. <laughs> Don't forget about me. And I I knew I needed something else. And so I think I, I remember the first thing I tried was I took an international women's writers class, and that was lovely. Um, I took a world music class. I thought my parents would be proud. They're both musicians. Um, and that was fun. There was a Birchard Scholars program at MIT that where you we got to once a month. Um, go to hear someone speak who was a, in the humanities and have a fabulous dinner. And I was like, food, speak, humanities, sign me up. Um, but eventually I was like, I, it's acting and I have to go back to acting. And I took, there there are acting courses at MIT. And so I took some and I did a, a few plays while I was there. But then again, I hit that moment where it was like, I, I need to choose. I'm a senior in college. This is when you make that choice. Are you going to go on to graduate school? Are you going to stay, um, just like leave, be done with with college and go out into the workforce? And I knew, again, that original dream of becoming an astronaut and an astronomer, I knew I needed to, ha to have a PhD. But I also had rekindled my love for acting. So I did I did what someone in my shoes might might think to do, which is cast my net as widely as possible. So I applied to PhD programs in astrophysics. And I applied to a few MFA programs in acting, but the few that I applied for were like, I, I shot for the moon. It was like Yale, the globe at UCSD and, uh, and the New York uh, school of the arts, Tisch school of the arts. And I didn't get into any of those programs, but I did get into the PhD program in astrophysics. And so I thought that's, that's what I meant to do. But during that first year, that feeling of being conflicted and divided didn't go away simply because I'd made that choice to go there. I mean, I, first for the first first thing, it didn't really feel like a conscious choice. It was, well, here's where I got in. I'm going, you know, like it wasn't necessarily actively going to something. And true to form during that that year, I kept thinking about acting. I was doing the problem sets and I was going through the motions. But what I really wanted to talk about was what movie would be nominated for Best Picture that year. Um, and 
I think that uh, that made it very difficult for me to excel in the way that I wanted to because my whole focus was was divided. Um, and it, was it during that period of time, Dr. Shields, that um, an older white male professor uh, suggested you should consider other career options and you listened to that advice and then you essentially ended up leaving the field for over a decade? Is that when that happened? That's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, there were some courses that I did well in, and there was this course called Basic Astrophysics, which I always laugh at because I don't think there's anything basic about astrophysics. Um, but there was that that professor who was teaching that course who suggested that I consider other career options, and he was a white male and an older white male. And I thought that he saw something that I didn't, that he saw some truth that I wasn't willing to admit. And I internalized that comment uh, for a long time. I took it as a sign. I'm not meant to be here. No one around here looks like me. Um, there was a black male um, who was on the faculty, but there were no black women. And I thought maybe he was a man. Maybe that was why it worked for him. Um, and I also had these interests that I didn't really see as as uh, widely represented among other astronomers or astronomy students. I loved fashion magazines and fashion. I loved makeup. Um, that seemed pretty rare um, in the communities I was I was existing within. So I thought, okay, um, this must be a sign that I'm not supposed to do this. I'm going to apply to acting schools again. And so I actually rode secret buses to Chicago and applied, uh, did auditions for acting programs. And I got in this time to the UCLA MFA acting program. Um, and I decided to go. I decided to defer from this PhD program at uh, Wisconsin Madison, and I moved out to LA. And you met your husband there. It had a, a very happy consequence. Uh, and and you had a, 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 a very good experience there. But uh, in your in your book, you write about after graduating, you show up for an audition and you're asked uh, by, um, I guess, your agent at the time, if you'd conditioned your hair recently, which you would interpret as advice to take better care of your hair rather than as maybe a racist comment. Now, would you interpret that the same way today, knowing what you know now? I think today I... I would hope that I would have the confidence to inquire more to that agent or that person, say at the very least, what did you mean by that? Um, these are things, the phrases, you know, I, I'm I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you could share more about why you think I need to condition my hair. Could you could you give me more information? These sorts of sentences I know now. And I didn't know them then. And I think I, I chalk that up largely to my youth, um, not knowing it. In my early 20s, I, I certainly didn't have that level of confidence that I have now, the confidence to be able to stand in my own truth and, and call someone out on a comment that could be interpreted in many different ways and that has the potential to be harmful. Um, and I would have liked to have said that to that professor way back then, say, hey, that 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 hurts my feelings. Why are you saying that? Those kinds of words. I didn't have those words back then. I, I, and I, and I had such a reverence for authority figures, which on one hand is, is appropriate. And on the other hand, can, that there's a naivety that I think that can run right alongside that and keep me from, um, inhabiting and, and feeling empowered, inhabiting my own body and my own power. Um, when we start to think that someone else knows more about us than we do. Um, and that's really, I think that the commonality in those two situations is that I assumed that those people who said those things were absolutely right, that they know they knew more about me than I did, and that the problem was me rather than that whole like this idea of considering the source you know and is this someone who like how how much do i want to take that feedback how much is that feedback how important it is to me could it be useful and if not can i just throw it out and let it rush right over me um but yeah at that point with that agent i assumed oh my gosh she said i should condition my hair um 
that must mean that I did not show up looking my best. And I felt very embarrassed, ashamed. And I, I, I never, this was like, I did this one of these uh, situations where you like drop by your agent looking like you have a job in hopes that that will put them, put yourself in their mind so that they'll want to get you out on more auditions. So I had had a, a theater piece coming up and I dropped by with a postcard and this was a suggestion by a friend and it's like you drop by um, and you don't stay long. It's like, oh, and like, I'm so busy, but I wanted to bring this by you and I'll, and then I'm going to go and have a great. And so it's like very in and out and leave them wanting more. Um, and that comment just kind of stopped me dead. And I was just like, okay, I'm never doing that again. Um, but yeah, what would it have been like if I had said, huh, what did you mean by that? You know, Advice like, to um, our younger selves. We all, yeah. we all could use that, I think. But you had moments that is so striking. You, you had a very zigzag path. You, you had a few false starts combining your love of acting and astronomy, such as wired science. You applied to join the astronaut program, but you weren't accepted. Um, but you had these moments where people really helped you and you or inspired you and moved you in a different direction. And one that's so notable in your book is, of course, the wonderful Neil deGrasse Tyson giving you the advice to get a get a PhD. Go back and get that PhD. And you started your PhD uh, program in 2009, the same year that Barack Obama took office. Now, how that, you know, you found, you found the courage to go back and do it after a 10-year break. How long did it take you to finish? And did you feel like you had found your true path when you were heading in that direction? Yes. Well, I can't wait for readers to to read that that section of the book because you get to find out really how what it's like to have that feeling of being adrift. Because I went through that feeling after acting school of like, okay, what now? Um, I didn't really know how to get a job in acting. I I was trained, but but I was now moving into a situation where unlike in traditional academia, I'll say, or at least astronomy, it's like you you get the training and then eventually you'll get a job doing the thing that you're trained to do. There's more of a higher chance of that, I it seemed to me, in astronomy or other um, technical disciplines than in acting. In acting, I had this training, but there was no guarantee that I was going to actually get a job doing what I was trained to do. Um, and so there's that whole, there's a whole um, part of the book that's like, what do I do now? And there's so many paths, paths and twists and turns. My journey is nothing, nothing close to linear. Um, but eventually, because of many different parts of my life, kind of all converging on the same, the same uh, guidance, which was go back to get the PhD, Neil deGrasse Tyson among them, but there were a few uh, I became willing and then went to that second PhD program, at University of Washington, 11 years, a full solar cycle after <laughs> leaving my first. And this, it took me, I did it in five years, which actually is is on the short side. Typically, it's on the order of six years um, for, for most students to get PhDs. Um, but I was on the fast track in many ways. I was an older returning student. I was 34 years old when I started that second PhD program. So more than 10 years older than most of my peers. Um, I was a black woman in a field dominated by white men. And I was a classically trained actor. So I had these three reasons to feel different and separate from. Uh, and I write a lot about what that manifested for, for me, that feeling, that imposter syndrome. Um, but on the other hand, I, I knew exactly what I wanted to do this time around. I was not, and this is why I think I did it in five years instead of six. I, we had, my husband and I both moved up there. He left a very well-paying job. I left a well-paying job. I had gotten a day job working at the, for the Spitzer Space Telescope and at Caltech. And so we knew that to to leave, to go to Seattle from LA, to exist on a grad student's salary, um, I had to want it bad. And I did. And I also knew what I wanted to study. I wanted to study this field that had proliferated since I'd been gone. And this was exoplanets, this 
these planets that are orbiting stars other than the sun. So they're in their own solar or stellar systems. And that field had really just exploded while I'd been away. And I knew I wanted to study that. And I think because of that laser focus and a lot of community, I didn't isolate this time around. I just availed myself of every single mentorship program and and a sense of support and community that I could. Um, it allowed me to, to really thrive in that program. And there was a pivotal moment when a mentor suggested that I view my theater background as my superpower. And that that allowed me to fully embrace who I was rather than think that I needed to sweep that acting background under the rug to be taken seriously as a scientist, which was how I had sort of started the PhD program thinking. Um, she said, no, own it. And that, and I was able to see how, how impactful my science, my acting training was on my scientist education. I mean, everything from giving talks to uh, being able to really invest personally in the research that I was pursuing, the acting training allowed me to do all of that. Absolutely. And it's why your your book is so inspiring. I think especially younger people who maybe uh, are experiencing what perhaps you experienced, you know, a period in their life where they're not quite sure. And um, you embrace that not sureness and got your way through it. And uh, it's also a great case study in in the benefits of being an older student and being focused. You know, you you came to it in your 30s and you went straight for it. Um, so it's a very powerful story and an inspiring story as well. So let's get to let's get to astrobiology. Let's talk about exoplanets a little bit. You mentioned that uh, the 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 field had exploded in a ten year period when you were studying act, acting. Was that because all of a sudden we discovered a lot more potential planets? What what happened? Well, when we had when I started, let's see. 1997 was when I started that first PhD program at Wisconsin-Madison. At that time, we knew of, so the first exoplanet, the first planet found around another main sequence star like the sun, another sun-like star, that was found in 1995. So a couple years later, there I am in that PhD program. Exoplanets aren't that big a thing at that point. Um, I don't know exactly how many have been discovered by 97, but it wasn't that much. There weren't, there weren't that many. Um, and then I'm gone for over a decade and people are finding more planets and more planets. And there's a mission that's that's being developed. That mission, Kepler, didn't fly until 2009 when I started my second PhD program. But all along during that period from 1998 to 2009, there were more ground-based observatories finding planets. And then certainly when Kepler came on the scene, that number almost exponentially grew. By So Kepler on its own, this is a space telescope like, like Hubble, but, but it was looking at the light from stars and looking for transits, looking for planets that pass in front of those stars from our viewing angle. And when they do that, they block out a little bit of the star's light, and then we can measure that dip in the star's light, and that can tell us that there's a planet orbiting around it and how large that planet is relative to the star. And we found close to 3,000 planets in the nearly 10 years of Kepler's uh, operating life. So by the time I was kind of ready to to embark upon a dissertation topic. So after passing my qualifying exam a couple of years into that second PhD program, we had we had thousands of planets discovered. And um, but I think before that, before Kepler had launched, people were discovering uh, planets with other instruments. And I would see these talks at Caltech because that's where I had my day job. And those were the talks that kept, as I write, stopping my heart, you know, like I, I would I could sit there listening to that particular astronomer talk forever. And I wanted to be that astronomer at the front of that room giving a talk about a planet that I'd found or a planet that I was studying. So, yes, that field had really started to develop during the time that I was away and really got going when I in my second Ph.D. program. Now, the first big paper paper that you co-authored was about the habitability of M-dwarf planets. Um, 
for somebody who knows very little about astronomy or astrobiology, what what is that about? Could you explain that to us? Absolutely. So there are many different types of stars in the sky. And even looking up at the sky with your naked eye, you can probably tell that that fact that some stars look a little different in color. Some stars look orange, orangish. Some stars look a little reddish. Some stars look white. That that sense of the color difference is a result of the temperature differences within these stars. And our sun is what's called a G star. And it's not the most common type of star in our galaxy. The most common type of star is actually a much cooler and redder star called an M star or an M dwarf or a red dwarf. There's a few different names we use, but they're all to describe the same type of star. And these small, cool red stars are 70%. They comprise 70% of all stars in the galaxy. And these stars are really interesting uh, because they're so numerous. They're often believed to be the, the best place to look at or to look to for the next planet in the universe where life might exist through sheer numbers alone. They're we think about they have the best the best chances of finding the next habitable planet around a type of star um, called an M star. But that's very this the environments of M stars are also quite unique. If you think about being on a beach and say you're at a little campfire and somewhere down the beach there's a larger bonfire and a party happening at that bonfire. The people that are crowded around the campfire have to sidle much closer up to that campfire to get the same amount of heat as they would those people at the bonfire. They wouldn't have to stand as close to that bonfire to get the same amount of heat because it's such a uh, much more stronger fire, more intense fire. This analogy we can use to describe stars. So the, the cooler and smaller the star, the closer a planet has to be to get the same amount of light. And light is energy, energy heats. And so a, a star, a planet needs that amount of energy, a certain amount of energy to be warm enough for liquid water. So planets that are in what we call the habitable zone, the region around a star where the planet might be warm enough, but not too warm for liquid water to be on the surface, which is what we are interested in because all life on earth needs liquid water. Um, those those environments really close up to the M stars could present complications for life. And so one of the things that our team and, and I started off as a grad student looking at particular properties that ice might have if, if ice is on a planet orbiting an M star, because water ice in particular has some interesting properties and depending on the type of light that ice gets from its star. Um, and we've been looking at different aspects of, of the M dwarf stellar environment ever since to really determine how likely it is for planets to be habitable around these stars. And, and there's still so much more that we can do. And so water is really what you're looking for, or the conditions where you might find water on these planets. And you're kind of looking for a Goldilocks situation where it's not too hot, not too cold. Is it? I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm dumbing it down here, but no, that, but that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So this is the first stop when we when a planet is discovered, and there are astronomers whose job it is to find those planets, and there are the the observers. Once a planet's found, my team's work begins. And we use computer models that are historically used to predict climate on the Earth and are continuing to be used in that way. But we're using them to predict climate on other planets around other stars. And we can change this, the host star, we can change the atmosphere, we can change all sorts of things about this particular planet in a model of whatever planet we're studying to determine once it's found how habitable it really is. So when observers find a planet, they can tell if it's in that, that Goldilocks zone, not too far away from its star to be too cold for life or liquid water, but not too close that if there were liquid water, the water would boil away. But that's only the first step really, because the habitable zone, this Goldilocks zone, assumes a lot of things about an exoplanet that we can't constrain yet. Things like what the atmosphere of that planet is. 
we're assuming that that planet that we have found would have an atmosphere like Earth. And with that information, we can determine what what distance this habitable zone exists at. Um, but that may not be the case. The atmosphere may be very much not like Earth, very unlike Earth's. Um, the shape of the orbit might not be circular like the Earth's is roughly. Um, the tilt of the orbit, how tilted the axis is that runs through north and south might not be the same amount of tilt as the Earth. And we know that tilt of the orbit says that affects a lot of things about our planet, namely our seasons. Um, and there's the kind of surface that might exist on an exoplanet. We have so many types of surfaces on the Earth. Just look outside. You'll see you know, a bunch of different surfaces, right? Whether it's with gravel and calcite and granite and ocean and grass, vegetation. I, we don't know anything about atmospheres or surfaces for these Earth-sized planets. So that's why our team's work using these computer models to fill in the gaps um, is so essential. Uh, because the habitable zone, we can calculate based on all these assumptions, but really how habitable a planet actually is, we need to use computer models to determine that. Hmm, so fascinating. So this amazing explosion of known planets is taking place in your world of astronomy and astrobiology. In the meantime, as you describe in your memoir, you get pregnant and you start hosting <laughs> a little life force of your own. So what was it like to be working at top speed in your field uh, and, and to know you were about to become a mother? Well, I have to say, uh, talk about life is I did not know it. Um, I mean, it really was um, a huge shift for me. I, I have often called myself a late bloomer. I haven't really mentioned that a whole lot in in, the, in public, but I've considered myself that in, in that going back to grad school later in life and becoming a parent much later in life than, than most people do um, have their first child. And for a long time, I wasn't even sure that I wanted to be a parent. I, I'm someone who tends to go after what I want with a lot of drive and ambition. And the fact that I hadn't done that, um, and here I was in my 40s and still hadn't done that, made me wonder if I really wanted that. But ultimately, I decided that I no longer wanted to stand in the way. Um, that's one thing I became certain of. I didn't want to stand in the way of there being a child if a child was meant to be. Um, and it turned out a child was meant to be, and and it really changed so much about our lives, um, and and really opened opened my eyes to the truly the possibilities that that could exist in my life beyond my wildest imagination. And I was at this point where, like it, it what I was doing for a living, which I had put a lot of energy and and I would say maybe even self worth into, became less pivotal for me because I was in charge of a life form. And I experienced that a conflict yet again, this time about work versus home. Um, I was able to, I was fortunate enough to be home for the first 10 months of my daughter's life. And then I needed to get back to work. And whenever I would go to work, there was that, that feeling that I needed to be home and, and, there, I wasn't quite sure how much I wanted to work. I, I'd never thought about not working outside the home until I had a child. And then it was like, what? where is this even meaningful? Um, and I think it was important to me to allow myself that time to ask those questions, to have those feelings, um, because it, it, it was a journey, the journey of producing a life form and the journey back into my role as a professional with a child that had its own evolution. And I think it would have been premature and um, kind of not authentic for me to have assumed that I could just jump right back into life the way it had been, because I couldn't. It, life was not ever going to be the same. And I didn't want it to be the same. So I had this moment in the book that I write about where I was giving a plenary talk at one of the big professional conferences in our field. And a plenary is the talk that's scheduled when nothing else is so that everyone can show up. 
and it seemed like almost everybody did show up to this talk. And I I had uh, dressed my daughter that morning in a Saturn dress. And I didn't know that my husband was going to bring her to the to the talk, but he did. And at one point I heard her squeal and I was in the middle of talking about, you know, blah, 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 exoplanets are awesome. And then I hear her squeal in the back of the, of the ballroom. They had opened two ballrooms for this thing. And I called out to her. I said, that's my daughter. And the most amazing thing happened. I said to, I said to her, I waved. She's like jumped up and down and, and my husband Steve's arms. And, and I said, mommy will be done soon. Um, and then everyone applauded. And I did not expect that. You know, it was this moment of like, I had not pretended that I hadn't heard her because I was worried that they, like I, I had totally acted from my heart. It was a, a reflex. There she was. I heard her. I couldn't deny it. I was, I wanted to, and I, I greeted her and, and the audience seemed to affirm that and support that. Um, and it was that, that moment of the professional and the personal, the lines had blurred and and I loved that because I've always felt that the personal informs the professional and should not be kept separate because how who we are says everything about what we want and love to do in the world um, and 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 bears very heavily on that. Uh, so it was really uh, gratifying to to hear the astronomy community um, support that choice with their applause. It was very affirming. That's a wonderful moment in the book. And I have one more question, and then we've got a lot of questions for you about space and about planets. Oh, we've got to get back to that. But um, you received early tenure at UC Irvine, and you wrote uh, two powerful essays for Inside Higher Education in 2021 about the cost of remaining silent in the face of overt racist and exclusionary attitudes. I was just, I, I read those this morning. I was very... Um, admiring of your courage for writing those those pieces. And I was wondering what was the fallout from those essays for you? Or was there a fallout? What happened after those were published? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for asking that. I remember being very nervous to write those, although I was emboldened uh, after tenure, after receiving news of the tenure award. And I knew I, I knew I wanted to say something because I had sat in faculty meetings for years hearing other faculty talk about their opinions of other students' potential to succeed in the field of physics um, and astronomy, primarily physics, because our, our department is uh, overwhelmingly uh, comprised of the, the, fac the faculty in physics um, are much larger and more numerous than our astronomy faculty. Um, and I remember staying silent during those comments and no longer wanting to. And so I wrote these essays and I remember being very purposeful about my research because I wanted to mention the statistics when it came to the number of bachelor's degrees awarded in physics and in astronomy for um, different historically marginalized communities. And then I, the the, the bulk of the essays are personal about my own experience of listening to those remarks and now standing a, a, apart from it, having a, an opinion about our role as professors when it comes to providing guidance to students on their career paths. I never received any negative feedback on those essays. In fact, I received largely support from other faculty um, people said they were glad that I had written those essays. Um, and I think the biggest message that I've hoped to convey through those essays and through this, the book, because I do mention those in the book, is that professors are, I, I, in my opinion, they're not powerful enough. We're not powerful enough to provide that kind of career and life-changing guidance to a student. Um, I will never tell a student that they should not continue in the field, that they should not, that they should con consider other career options. That's not my job. I'm not powerful enough to do that. I don't know what their path is. Um, I'm one human being 
whether they belong in the field is up to them and the universe. Um, what I can ask them is how much they love what they're doing and whether they love it enough to work hard enough to get good at it and work hard enough to do well in my class and beyond. Um, because I, I don't think that if someone loves something enough, they're automatically going to get be good at it. That hasn't always been my experience. Um, and it ha it's not the point. When, when we love something, it's not, I, and I don't think that loving something means I'm necessarily going to be good at it, but I love it because I, I enjoy the experience of doing it, of learning about it, of being with that thing. And, and, but yet if I have that love and if that love is strong and I want to do more with it, I want to go somewhere with that, then that love is what's going to support me as I do the things I need to do to produce and, and meet the goals and produce the work that will carry me forward in that thing. Um, so so Dr. Shields, what's, what is the best professional, and we're moving into questions that our audience has, what is the best professional or personal advice that you've received and who is it from? Well, something that comes to mind is from my writing teacher, Natalie Goldberg. Uh, she taught me how to write, and she has a, her own unusual background in that she combines writing with Zen practice. And so a lot of her writing advice is based on her Zen training. And one of the things that she's always taught us, her students, is continue under all circumstances um, and also make positive effort for the good. So I remember, and I write about this moment in the book, and I, I had gone to one of her retreats in Taos, New Mexico, and I was overwhelmed with fear of not passing my qualifying exam at this, the second time around at the University of Washington. And I wrote it on, she offered students uh, the opportunity to write questions for her on scraps of paper and put them in a big glass pitcher and she would answer them um, and as she was available. And I wrote like a diatribe on this scrap of paper of, oh my God, the last black woman to take this qual failed and failed again. And I'm going to be the other one. And I'm, I'm so afraid. And, and she left a note for me the next day. And I'm going to swear here, <laughs> unless, unless you'd rather I spell it out. But she wrote, there's a swear word in there. Would you like me to spell it rather than say it for general audiences? We, uh, you spell it out. Spell it okay. out. Okay. Okay. So she she wrote, "You're on the horse now, effing ride it." <laughs> that's good advice. <laughs> and it was that's basically continue under all circumstances. So all these feelings that we have, fear, anxiety. Oh my God, do I belong? Am I? Should I do this? What it doesn't really matter. The feelings are going to go. They're 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 going to pass. There'll be other feelings. Those are going to pass. And if I can remember that and just do the thing that I want to do along as the feelings are going, then things keep moving on. So it's like not, not be tossed away by the feelings. Just keep moving forward. Excellent advice. Now, another question from the audience. What excites you the most about your field? And do you think there's a discovery that will happen in the next 10 or 20 years? Mm. A big discovery. Yes. So I, I uh, got the pleasure of um, being on Good Morning America a couple of weeks ago, and I was asked if we were going to discover life and within my lifetime answer that question, are we alone? And, and I, what I can say, of course, I can't predict the future, but I can say that we are, we're discovering things that much more quickly than I believe we thought we would. Um, even just thinking about the James Webb Space Telescope, which many people thought would not be capable of discovering Earth-sized planets, we've already been able to confirm the existence of an Earth-sized planet in just the first year of operations of that telescope. Um, so I believe that anything is possible. And as our instrumentation is becoming more advanced, even more quickly than we had imagined and envisioned, um, that it would be quite exciting to me if we were able to determine the 
atmospheric composition of an Earth-sized exoplanet, and therefore that would lead us to be able to look for signs of life in that planet's atmosphere or on its surface. But I think even more exciting might, might be, and maybe even more attainable within the next 10 to, to 20 years, is within our own solar system. We have a couple of missions that are going back to the moons of our gas giant planets. One is going to Jupiter's moon Europa, which hosts a liquid water ocean underneath the ice. And that mission is going to try to drill down through the ice and see if there's anything in that ocean. And what would that, like, we could actually end up discovering life within our own backyard. And that's really exciting because we wouldn't have to contend with the vast astronomical distances that we we have that we're up against with exoplanets. So, um, and then Dragonfly is another mission that's set to go to Titan. And there's a liquid on Titan, that's Saturn's moon, Titan. But this liquid is not water. It's liquid ethane and methane. And if there's life swimming around in that in those oceans, that life is life as we do not know it. So um, any of those discoveries would, I think, be would qualify as like the, the top for me. <laughs> so now that private companies are embarking on space travel, do you have an interest in going to space? And would you consider living on another planet if that was possible? <gasps> I would. However, I have some some uh, conditions. Uh, I you know, I once wanted to be an astronaut more than anything, and I think having a family has dampened that desire a bit because I wouldn't want to be away from my family for more than a few months. So the idea of like interstellar missions, um, that would be, unless I could take my family with me, I, I wouldn't sign up for those. But I would love to go to the International Space Station, of course, back to the moon, and maybe even be willing to go to Mars. That's only like an eight month journey. Um, but that's, that's still a long time. But yes, I, I think if I were given the opportunity, I, it would be hard to imagine turning that down. <laughs> okay. This is irresistible question to ask you. Um, and it has to do with, let me just find this one. Uh, what is your favorite science movie or TV series involving science? Oh, I love it. So my favorite, oof, I was going to, I am going to just stick with it. The Abyss is my favorite sci-fi movie, even though it's not about space. Apollo 13 is a close second, definitely about space. Uh, science fiction related TV series, got to be Star Trek, The Next Generation, oldie but goodie, and Battlestar Galactica, the reboot, is um, a close second. Mm, I've got to say, live long and prosper. Yes. yes. As, a star, as a fellow Trekkie. Um, and uh, uh, a last question for you. What is your 60-second idea to change the world? Oh, my gosh. All right. I'm going to set my timer. <laughs> you said 60 seconds. Well, you could um, take a little longer if you want. Okay kindness um kindness and peace and everyone going after what lights them up inside their deepest dreams embracing their whole selves and full potential if we had a whole world of people who felt free enough to do that um who felt supported enough to pursue their dreams to be the thing that they'd always wanted to be I think it would be a lot easier for people to be kind, to hold peace in their hearts, and to work together towards a common goal of spreading that love and that kindness um, and that that support and empowerment to others. It's 47 oh. seconds. <laughs> very, very good. But I think we actually have a, a little bit of extra time. So I'm going to throw in one more bonus question okay. for Dr. Shields. In, in your book, you talk about reconciling your faith in God with your life as a scientist. How do you do that? That's a big question. You may not be able to do that in just a minute or two, but. So I, I'm glad that this came up and I, I've never felt 
a conflict between my science training and my role as a scientist and my belief in spirituality um, and in something bigger than myself and bigger than any of us. And I, I to give an example of that, science tells us that there's something that happened called the Big Bang that created everything that we know of from nothing, like a single spark. And that's the first chapter of my book is called The Big Bang. <laughs> Um, and that happened, cosmologists tell us maybe around 10 to the minus 34 seconds, something like that. But what caused the Big Bang? What happened before the 10 to the minus 34 seconds to make everything, you know, be created out of nothing? And that is an example of like, there's a space between what we can prove as scientists and what we may never know. And that is the space in which I think a power greater than all of us resides. Um, I know from my own experience, which is chronicled in this memoir, that there are so many examples that I have of things happening that were beyond my imagination. I didn't create those things. I couldn't have thought of this way to combine my love for science with my love for acting and art and the arts. And it turns out I didn't have to. I didn't have to figure it out. I didn't have to work harder, which was a default mode for me. I simply had to stay open and ask something out there for help. And I got that help. I, I was able to, I was shown or it was revealed to me that there were things that I couldn't have planned for myself that that were that I was meant to do, like host a science TV show that I like I, I didn't think about that. It sort of fell into my lap be a TED fellow. That again was something that someone suggested I apply for this TED fellowship. And there I am giving a TED talk, which is one of the few instances where I felt like my whole persona was represented both sides of my brain. Um, so these examples are showing me that something else outside of myself wanted something, a path for me um, and had a plan for me. And I didn't really have to know what that plan was. I simply had to follow the breadcrumbs and to do what the next thing that was indicated. Um, so you know, there's a lot, so much that science can tell us. And I follow the scientific method to understand the natural world and the universe around me. And then there are some things that even science can't explain. And that's where, that's why spirituality um, is there. And I love, there's someone who said, and of course, Carl Sagan always said that science is a profound source of spirituality. Um, so for him, there was no conflict either. Although I would imagine it, he was talking about when he practices the science, he felt that same reverence that many people feel when they're in a, some a religious environment, like a church. And I'm sort of going a little bit further than Carl Sagan might have by saying that science can explain so much and yet science can only can only explain so much. And there are things that even science can't explain. And then there's where spirituality uh, fits in. But I, I love that someone a long time ago, who I don't remember said that science, and I think they said religion, I, I choose spirituality as in, instead to use, should never be in conflict. And if they are, then one or the other is overstepping its bounds. So that, what that's telling me is that everything has its own boundaries, even the practice of science. And then there's what else is out there? Well, we began with your sense of wonder as a child looking up at the sky in the San Diego area. And we're ending with a sense of wonder as you as a very distinguished scientist. And this has been such a gift to have you here. So our thanks to... Dr. Elmama Shields, author of Life on Other Planets, a memoir of finding my place in the universe. Uh, we encourage everyone to visit uh, our website, www.commonwealthclub.org. And thank you for being here. I'm Julia Flynn Sila. Thank you, Julia.